You know, I've never actually read this arc before now. Wait, what do you mean you've never read it? Okay, so back in the day when I watched One Piece, I watched it on the Four Kids dub, and for some okay. reason, they cut this entire arc out of the dub. But this is the Usopp arc, and you just skipped it? You're telling me you, you never listen, seen it? Listen, okay, listen. When I came back and in Impul Down, I just relied on my memory and jumped, jumped right in there. Next thing you'll tell me is that you've never seen Skypea either. So, after leaving Whiskey Peak with Vivi, the Princess of Alabasta, in their care... Oh my god, okay. <laughs> oh my god. So there was this guy named Gold Roger, and he left a bunch of treasure when he died. After that, they meet a talking reindeer who's actually a doctor. But then, a giant bear man sends Luffy to an island of Amazonian women. So, an evil ghost scientist accidentally turns the son of a samurai into a dragon. Then, the Straw Hats become world famous after crashing a wedding. And that's how Luffy becomes King of the Pirates! The Straw Hats relax a little bit on the ship and the Going Merry before they arrive at the second island on the Grand Line, which is this jungle environment with the giant plants. And also on the way, they were being chased by a giant dolphin they just thought was part of the Grand Line, but maybe not so. Sanji is kind of indifferent, which is kind of the point, like he's very strong. Nami is pretty worried, which is kind of her thing at this point, but Luffy is excited for this adventure that they found themselves in where things are so huge, which is kind of what he said all the way back in Baratier when Mihawk showed up, was that like he's excited that things are weird and scary and just like don't make sense on this, this new world. He's very excited about it. Once they dock onto the island, they decide to go explore it, including Vivi, who says basically like she's just going to be bored if she sits here and does nothing. So she goes off with Luffy and Sanji and Zoro. They start a bet uh, to see who can bring back the most meat. And that leaves Nami and Usopp on the ship. And they're looking very crestfallen, sort of despondent. This is also interesting because this, uh, we've seen this a little bit before all the way back in Syrup Village. We're seeing this more so now as Sanji and Zoro have their dynamic as like these two extremely powerful members of Luffy's crew. And they pair up a lot and do stuff or like, not, maybe, not, maybe not pair off in this instance, but like they go off and do something kind of mirrored each other. Whereas Nami and Usopp, the very weak members kind of stick together. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we will see uh, throughout One Piece. Like they are the most normal and human-like of the Straw Hat members. So as everyone except for Nami and Usopp are exploring the island, they find a bunch of ancient animals like Ammonites, which if you've ever seen the Pokemon Ammonite, this is basically what this is. The little shell guy? The little shell guy, yeah. yeah. That's a that's why he's a fossil Pokemon in Pokemon, because they're they're extinct and they're ancient. And then when Luffy and Vivi look up, not only are there ancient animals, there are giant dinosaurs. And Vivi explains kind of what we've been saying so far, that the unstable climate and geography of the Grand Line allows for these huge variety of ecosystems. And on this island it seems like they never develop past like the dinosaur age. Meanwhile, back at the ship, Nami remembers that she knows what this island is and references a book that quotes, to its inhabitants, the island truly is a little garden. Therefore, let us call it Little Garden, Land of the Giants. And so we now have a name for this island, just like last one was Whiskey Peak. This one is Little Garden. And it's ironically named because the things here are gigantic. <laughs> and speaking of gigantic, right at this moment, a literal giant named Broggy, he shows up uh, at the Going Merry, and he pretty jovially uh, asks Nami and Usopp for some ale, even though they are absolutely terrified of this man. They're like, if we just stay still and do nothing, he'll go away, it's fine. And he's just staring down at them like, you guys wanna get drunk? Yeah. <laughs> and right at this moment, this huge T-Rex, who's like about his size, comes running behind him, pretty casually just turns around and slices this dinosaur's head off with his ax and says, behold, the mightiest warrior El of Elbaf, Bragi. And then he says, hey, we have a feast now, come back to my campsite. <laughs> and that they're his guests. And they oblige him, even though they are, again, terrified out of their minds. And on the way to his campsite, Nami asks him how long it'll take to reset the log post. It's like I mentioned before, when you come to an island, you have to reset the, your log post to get to the next island. And that can take anywhere from days to weeks to months, or in this case, it can take a full year, as Bragi says. So on a separate part of the island, Luffy is having fun sightseeing from atop this like huge long neck dinosaur when it like suddenly rears up and eats him. And so while Vivi's like freaking out, 
Um, he is rescued when another giant, a different giant, slices the dinosaur's head off and Luffy comes out of its neck. And he introduces himself as Dory, the mightiest warrior on Elbaf. Which is weird because we have two people who say they're the mightiest warrior on Elbaf and also what is Elbaf? This is Little Garden. This is not Elbaf. And so Dory, much like Bragi took Nami and Usopp, Dory takes Luffy and Vivi back to his home for a feast as well, because they also have a feast now that there are two different beheaded dinosaurs on different parts of the island. So Luffy has a pretty good time with Dory. He's not really scared of him, which makes sense. He's pretty fearless. Um, and he even, he even like jokes around with him, uh, basically saying like he would he would beat him up if he was interested in it. And Dory's like, I like your spirit, kid. You're, you, got, <laughs> you got some guts on you. And but he asks Dory why he is all alone on this island. And Dory says that uh, he's from Elbaf, a land of warriors that is farther along in the Grand Line. And he's here in Little Garden because he started some trouble and now he must fight to the death with someone else to settle his dispute. However, they've been at this for 100 years now and there is still no winner. Also, I want to mention this moment because I've always thought of giants as basically like living forever, but Dory here says that giants live about three times the average lifespan of a human. And humans in One Piece are a little weird, but even if we assume that like- Max is like 100, 150. Then like they've essentially wasted like 30 years on this island fighting, which like I was imagining as sort of like a blip on the radar, but like it's kind of a long time. Who's your favorite giant out of the two? Oh. I'm partial to Bragi. I guess I have to go with Dory then just for the, the fun of it. <laughs> really? Or were you going to say Bragi? I was going to say Bragi. I like Bragi. He's round. He's... He's yeah, he's around. he's yeah. cute. He's adorable. Dory's fine, but Bragi is very friend shaped. If we haven't explained what they look like, Bragi is like a more rounded giant, a round face. He carries an axe and a shield, and Dory has more of like a rectangular head, and he carries a sword and a shield. Obviously, with the warrior thing, they are very Viking coded. That's why they're obsessed with fighting to the death and, and ale and getting drunk. So essentially, the Elbaf is like the Viking homeland, and like they are essentially Vikings. So right on cue, the signal for their fight, which is uh, a volcano that erupts at the center of the island, goes off and Bragi charges in at Dory towards the center of the island. They both charge there and Vivi wonders like what kind of hatred would make them fight for a hundred years and Luffy tells her it's not about hatred, it's honor. Like He gets it. This is about honor and dignity and they don't hate each other. It's just like they have something to settle and they're going to do it with their fists. And Dory says, yeah, he's right. And also, I don't know why we're fighting. I forgot about that. We both have forgotten this a long time ago. I fucking love this shit, bro. They don't even know why they're beefing. They're just beefing. Just, they forgot long ago why the fuck they, they have a problem with each other. And they're still scrapping because of honor. Back at Bragi's camp, while Bragi leaves and goes to fight, Nami wants to flee back to the ship. She's like, he's gone, we're good. And Usopp tells her that... No, this is a real battle between true warriors. And more importantly, he now knows what his dream to be a brave warrior of the sea means. He wants to have honor like Dory and Bragi, and also he wants to visit Elbaf, because if they're cool warriors from Elbaf, there must be so many cool warriors in Elbaf. And so this is not a new dream for Usopp necessarily, but it is added on to his dream. Like he wants to visit Elbaf. It's like Mihawk for Zoro. Zoro had a dream for being the best swordsman. He met Mihawk. It gave him like a concrete place for his dream to happen, like to beat Mihawk. Usopp wants to be a great warrior of the sea. And now he has a place to go to maybe learn how to be that. It also helps to remember that Usopp is 17 and has like never left his island. And so he's just very excited about these cool, tough guys. Doesn't have a father figure either. <laughs> he also doesn't have a father <laughs> figure. Now he has two dads. So Dory and Bragi, they fight pretty briefly, but they end in yet another draw. Bragi mentions that it's like 73,460 fights in a draw. And so they return to their, their own campsites to drink and make merry. So Dory goes back to Vivi and Luffy and Bragi goes back to Nami and Usopp. Bragi tells Usopp that to die a glorious death is the greatest honor of all, while Dory tells Vivi and Luffy that most humans die before the year that it takes to reset their log pose. And then almost before he can even finish his sentence, the ale he was drinking explodes and Luffy begins a fight with, with Dory because Dory accuses him of doing it. Nami and Usopp gave Bragi the ale when he showed up and Bragi shared it with Dory after their fight because he was like hey bro good fight you know here's some ale cool off 
and it ended up exploding. So whose fault is it? It looks kind of like the Straw Hats. Hats' fault, right? And so Luffy and Dory fight. They kind of trade blows. And because Dory is so wounded, because his insides are all torn up from the bomb that he just drank, Luffy does knock Dory out. Although Luffy is also like pretty bruised up from it. Like it wasn't an easy fight even with this like giant who is very damaged. Luffy then gets extremely angry because like Usopp, he understands the importance of this fight. And he's mad that someone would sabotage this this battle this this century long battle between these two and he decides to find the person on the island that attacked dory meanwhile nearby we see a dinosaur attack a small house of wax while mr five the agent from the the with the bomb powers from the previous arc that we thought was, was defeated and his partner miss valentine easily knock out this dinosaur then they enter this house to find mr three and miss golden week so two more numbered agents in Baroque Works, if we're following the theme, the lower the number, the stronger the agent. So Mr. Three is stronger than Mr. Five. And we could also assume that his partner, Miss Golden Week, is also stronger than Miss Valentine. Typically they're paired up kind of based on power sets and level of strength. So Mr. Three is a very scrupled, uh, well-dressed man. He has a fade that uh, leads in with his hair styled into the shape of a three. Miss Goldenwig looks like a small child with long braided hair and a paintbrush and she also seems kind of very quiet while as like Mr. Three is uh, very boastful, he's very intelligent. He, he berates Mr. Five and Miss Valentine for being weak and getting defeated by a random rookie from the East Blue. Um, but he tells them that like they can still make it up to their boss, Mr. Zero, Sir Crocodile of the Warlords by capturing Dorian Bragi, two legendary pirates from a century ago who still hold a bounty of 100 million each. And it's important to note because like giants are like not super common in One Piece, but they do, they, I mean, they're common enough, right? And so when the world government put a bounty on their heads, like that lasts until they revoke it. It's not like, it, there's no clemency provided after a certain amount of time. So even a hundred years later, this bounty is still active on these giants. It was kind of cool that they were they were in a whole pirate crew full of giants. Like, that was kind of cool. Yeah. And also, 100 years ago was well before the Golden Age of Piracy. Because that only happened 22 years prior. So, like, they spent a lot of time being pirates before it was kind of cool to do. And they were regarded as very violent pirates who apparently killed lots of people and, and kind of raided the seas until they ended up here on Little Garden. But Mr. Three, even though he's very confident in his abilities, he does explain that like he can't take them in a fair fight and that's why he had Mr. Five sabotage their ale, which explains why it exploded, right? Mr. Five can make any of his body parts, including his boogers, into bombs, which is disgusting. Ugh. At the same time, the signal for the fight goes off again, which so apparently it just goes off pretty frequently. I guess it's like, random so you could just have like a period of time where there are no fights but like i guess they kind of like have to be ready at all times and so today it exploded several times and so despite being very badly wounded dory returns to fight Bragi. but before he leaves like dory apologizes to luffy for accusing him of sabotage basically it's like i guess he assumes that because luffy was honorable enough to fight him over this misunderstanding that like he clearly would not have stooped so low to do this so he was not him but he just kind of like picks up his house, which is like a gig gigantic like rock, and just sets it on top of Luffy and pins him under it and just leaves him there. And he tells him that the divine judgment of their god was not on his side. Part of this thing is that they fight to the death because of this argument that they had. And whoever wins is chosen by the god of Elbath. And so he says that like, clearly I'm not going to win, I'm too injured. And so that means that my god's divine judgment was not on my side. And Luffy basically tells, calls him stupid, like yells at him that like your fight was interfered with. It's not a fair reason for you to lose. And then he says like, would you give up your life if your God asked for it? Dory kind of just ignores him and just leaves. So Bragi goes to leave to begin the fight also. And Usopp tells Nami, even if someday I lose everything and face death alone on a deserted isle, I'll die proud of the way I lived. And also I am Usopp, a brave warrior of the sea, because he is also kind of in awe that like Bragi would go off and fight pretty immediately after the last fight. Like they're clearly, even if they're tired, they're honor bound by their code. And he really respects that. They also show no fear. There's no fear, which is the opposite of Usopp, right? Usopp is always scared, but these guys show no fear in the face of battle. They just get up and go, right? And I think he really 
finds that cool. Again, two new dads. So they then, they leave. They like run away and they're like really scared because they want to go back to the ship. But Nami finds this like really weird Luffy on the island. He's just like propped up against a tree and he's like smiling with his like eyes covered. Like it's like the universal anime sign that like this guy is evil. And she's like, Luffy, that's really weird. And on a different side of the island, we see Zoro for the first time in a while. And he's come across a weird Nami kind of doing the same thing. But Usopp runs to Dory's campsite where he finds Luffy and Vivi. Obviously, Luffy is pinned under this giant rock. So, Broggy and Dory are fighting. They're trading blows back and forth. And during the fight, Broggy, like, realizes something is off. He says, like, you know, what has gotten into you today? Like, you're not fighting, like, normal. And Dory says, like, you're, you're misunderstanding. Like, you know what you're talking about. I'm not hurt. And so he refuses to back down or even explain that he's been injured. Kind of like you were saying, there's no fear in his eyes. He, he is determined to to carry this fight out, even though he clearly should not be. He should just be like, hey, like, I want to do this fight the right way. But no, that's not that's not the warrior's code. The war It says the volcano goes off. We fight. I'm here to fight. We throw hands, right? The volcano goes off. We throw hands. And it's also important. Dory thanks Broggy for the ale. He's like, the ale is delicious, brother. Even though the ale is the reason why he's hurt. He's like, that ale was refreshing. Let's get to... Let's get to the ones, right? It's so cool. I mean, I guess if they haven't seen anybody in a while, they haven't really had any ale. So like, I guess Dory kind of considers it like this one last treat before he dies finally, right? Before this feud ends. And even so, even though he is clearly injured, he's still fighting very well. But Mr. Three, hoping to finish him off, uh, somehow creates wax underneath his feet. It causes him to slip. And Broggy is like, oh, I finally got you. And he comes in with his ax um, and bears down on Dory. He then weeps at having defeated his friend while Mr. Three walks out and he basically like chides him for it and says like, oh my god, you're, su you're such a brute. Like you would weep with tears of joy after like your fight ended. Like how simple of you. And Dory says, you don't, who first off, he says, who the fuck are you? And then he says, you have no clue what you're talking about. These are not tears of joy. That was my friend. I just want to mention it's 73,467 draws and one win. So Broggy is clearly very angered after being provoked by Mr. Three, but Mr. Three basically says, you're my prisoner now. And he creates wax all around Broggy and forces him to the ground where he like pins him to the ground with his wax. So back at Dory's campsite, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine arrive with an injured Karoo. And Mr. Five explains that they were trying to separate Vivi and Luffy because Luffy is the only one that they were actually worried about. He tried to separate them by getting Karoo to cry out, but Karoo refused to do it. He was like, absolutely not. I will not do this. Karoo, for a reminder, is like a duck build chocobo situation. He's, a, he's like Vivi's literal ride or die. He refuses to give her up, even if it means like he's about to get like his ass kicked. He got beat. Like they beat him mercilessly and he would not cry out. It man. does not look good for Karu. Then Usopp like realizes that like, oh, they're the ones who interrupted this fight. Like they did this. And he angrily tells them that he'll defeat them for interrupting Dory and Bragi's battle. Which again, top tier Usopp moment. I love when Usopp gets to like just genuinely pop off and like be brave and like invest it in fights and not just like randomly wind up somewhere where he accidentally wins his way through it. I love it. This is, like you said before. This is his moment. That's why four kids couldn't dub it because it would have been too powerful. Nah. Uh anti Usopp propaganda, understandable. However, Luffy is still trapped um, and Usopp and Vivi are, are quickly taken down by the Brokeworks agent. Um, even though Vivi tries to do her little hypnosis dance, it does not work. However, Mr. Five, before he defeats her, mentions Mr. Three and Vivi confirms that he did eat the wax wax fruit. So his powers do come from a devil fruit. The first part of the series, we only saw really two. And then we saw like two more right when they before they enter the Grand Line. And now we've seen three more just in these like first arcs. So like we're racking up some Devil Fruit users now. Like they're really popping up now. That makes sense. Cause even though Devil Fruits are pretty rare, the Grand Line is such an anomaly of strength across the One Piece world that like to even really survive, you have to really have a Devil Fruit user, especially if you're going to be a pirate, right? You need to have a Devil Fruit power because like it gives you such an advantage over other people. The agents, they take Vivi back to Mr. Three, where they reveal that they also caught Nami and Zoro. Uh, and we can assume that the Luffy and Nami that they found were actually wax statues created by 
Mr. Three. Mr. Three places Vivi on this like giant candelabra alongside Nami and Zoro, which is made of wax. And he reveals that like he is planning to turn them all into wax statues um, and that their legs are trapped in the in the wax and they can't leave. What they assume is mist around them turns out to be wax from Mr. Three and it is coating around him. Important to note, when he uses his powers, the top of his hair catches on fire and becomes like a, a basically a candle, which makes him a candle man. While he's like turning these three into statues, he taunts Bragi for basically being stupid and being deceived and killing his friend and basically saying that like, you knew something was wrong, but you didn't show him mercy like a beast. And Bragi responds with, you know nothing of duels and honor. You could have never understood why I cried. You know nothing. He was a proud warrior who chose to, to fight despite his injuries. How could I shame him by refusing him battle? When he was willing to suffer so in order to fight, how could I dishonor him by showing mercy? And then he breaks out of the wax that just like a second ago, Mr. Three claimed was harder than steel. He's injured. He's like getting his ass beat. He's like turning into wax a little bit and he's just like still breaks out of it. Back at Dory's camp, Luffy Ask both Usopp and Karu if they're willing to let the Broke Works agents get away with what they've done. They both show immense bravery and basically are like, no, we're going to beat them. And Luffy smiles and says, okay, let's go clobber those guys. They are pissed, by the way. They are like roaring mad. Yes, it's such a good mm -hmm. scene. And like, it's such a good, it's good for all of them because Usopp and Karu are very angry. And Luffy is just happy like he he's just his, his his usual self of like i'm gonna get out of this and we saw this a second ago they tell zoro like oh yeah we've captured the straw hat guy he's like oh you caught luffy okay he clearly understands how strong luffy is there was also another fun, funny moment where zoro and them were captured on the candelabra this is the first time zoro seeing a giant yo this dude must have ate his vegetables growing <laughs> up i thought that was funny <laughs> yeah and so speaking of this giant, Bragi. Unfortunately for him, uh, Mr. Three and Mr. Five both attack him. Mr. Five throws out some bombs at him and Mr. Three stabs him in the hand uh, and the legs and the, sorry, the hands and the feet with these like giant wax swords and basically pins him into the ground. Um, and he starts like crying, basically saying that like he's upset that he doesn't get to die a warrior's death, that like he's going to die being this like statue for this like fucking freak um, who's obsessed with torturing these people and that he wanted to um, to have a real battle and die like a warrior. Nami is like freaking out. She's like begging Zoro to do something. And Zoro just kind of like looks over at Bragi. He's like, hey, can you still move? I know you can still move because I can still move if I cut my legs off and then I can fight. <laughs> and he starts doing it. He starts cutting his fucking leg off. It's fucking insane. Like he's cutting his legs off. The Baroque Works agents are watching him cut his legs off and they're thinking he's insane. Nami and Vivi are watching him cut his legs off and they think he's insane. So basically everyone except Bragi thinks he's insane for coming up with this idea to cut his legs off to try to fight. Bragi's down with it. He's like, hey bruh, I like your spirit, you know? Fortunately for Zoro, <laughs> because he would have lost a leg, right before he can finish doing his plan, Luffy, Usab, and Karu arrive and Luffy begins his fight with Mr. Three. First I want to say when Luffy Usopp and Karu bust through the jungle to this area where they're at. Luffy sees Mr. Three for the first time and he sees the three wick on his head that's lit and he he starts like making fun of him. He's like, you, you got a goofy ass cut, bro. Like, <laughs> like what's, what's that on your head, bro? Oh no, right? Um, Zoro, on seeing that Luffy has come in to like save them, he starts to pose because he's like, all right, bro, we're saved. And if I'm going to be a statue, I might as well look cool while I do it. So he starts to pose with his sword. Nami and Vivi are, think he's like stupid, but he thinks it's really cool. I also want to point out here, because when, when he arrives, Mr. Three says that he will kill Straw Hat Luffy. And this is like the first time that we've seen someone call him by his full epithet. Like it's not just straw hat it's not just luffy it's straw hat luffy luffy usopp and karu they're pissed but luffy starts first by launching himself at mr three who decides to take care of luffy because he's the biggest threat right so it's kind of luffy versus mr three he locks luffy's legs together in wax but luffy just uses the bar on his legs to like stretch and swing around and destroy part of the candelabra that's holding his friends however he fucks it up because the candelabra like lowers a level. So now they're just getting hit with more wax and getting covered in wax quicker. 
Usopp shoots an exploding star at Mr. Five, but he ate like the explosive fruit. So he just eats it out the air and it blows up and in his stomach and it doesn't hurt him at all. Like he's made of explosion. Back to Mr. Three and Luffy. Mr. Three goes for Luffy's hands this time with the wax powers, right? He locks Luffy's hands together with wax, but it doesn't seem he's caught on that this is a really dumb idea because Luffy just uses the wax hands that he has to just knock the shit out of Mr. Three, sending him flying. Nami excitedly tells Luffy to hurry and get them out the trap at this point. She's like, oh, you beat him. Like, hurry up and get us out the trap. But Luffy uncharacteristically says uh, he doesn't want to help them. And this is where we're introduced to Miss Golden Week's power. The little girl that is the partner of Mr. Three. She used an ability. Uh, she also has a devil fruit power, and she used an ability. No, it's not. It's not a devil fruit. Oh, it's not. It's just her. It's just her regular powers. Oh, I kind of assumed it was, but I, I don't know. I think most people did, which is why Oda clarified later on that it's not a devil fruit. It's just she just like has control over people's emotions like this. That's crazy. Yeah, she's kind of busted. The ability that she used it was called Color Trap, and basically what it does is she paints on the ground in a certain color and the paint when the opponent steps on it influenced that person's emotions. So the trap she laid was black paint. The paint is like betrayal. The color is betrayal. Betrayal black, right? Usopp and Karu try to help Luffy, but they're blocked by Mr. Five and Miss Valentine and they decide to like dip into the forest for now. Also, Luffy breaks out of the betrayal paint because Vivi, using her knowledge of the Baroque Works agents, tells him that don't save them, stay on the paint. And because he betrays his friends, he does the opposite and he pulls back off of it. So Miss Golden Week uses a few more of her colors on Luffy. Uh, she uses a yellow ability that forces him to laugh uncontrollably and a red ability that forces him to attack what she drew on the ground like a, more like a bull. The last one she puts directly on Luffy's shirt though and it's a calming green paint, right? And this paint basically just chills Luffy out like he's high. Like he's just sitting on the ground drinking tea, like talking about how nice of a day it is and stuff. He's crying through through it. Like he wants to fight, but like he's forced to just be chill and, and sit and drink tea. Usopp sees this all while riding on Karu, dodging attacks by Mr. Five and decides to concoct a plan. He, round, he rounds himself out of the jungle, dodging attacks by Mr. Five, and then he shoots a fire star out of his slingshot right on Luffy's back, setting his uh, shirt on fire. This frees Luffy from the effect at the cost of his shirt, right? But the fight isn't over because at this point, Mr. Five decides to draw the fucking Blicky out of his pocket and Instead of bullets in the chamber, he just spits into like the six shooter, loading it with explosives because that's his powers, right? And then he starts firing at Usopp, almost taking him and Karu completely out of the fight. But it's okay because at this point, Luffy is free, so he can fight. But it doesn't matter even more because at this moment, Mr. Three turns into a fucking mech. That's right. He uses his wax powers to basically encase himself in a fucking mech that he claims is as tough as steel, right? Luffy tries to fire several of his uh, patented moves at him. You know, gum gum stamp, pistol, the whole toolkit he throws at him. But he can't get the steel, he can't get through the steel wax that the mech is made out of. Usopp, however, throws him a tip. He tells him that even if it's wax, it'll still melt and it can still be melted with fire, right? This, however, draws ire from Miss Valentine, who walks up to a downed Usopp and Karu to finish them off. And Usopp gives Karu rope that's covered in uh, oil and tells Karu to just go fucking run, book it, book it, escape. Miss Valentine doesn't know what the plan is at this point, but for his insolence, she uses her Kilo Kilo fruit to jump in the air and land directly onto Usopp with 200 kilos of weight. Even though he's like got bodied by Miss Valentine, he still managed to tell Luffy that 
you know, you can melt the wax with fire or heat, right? And Luffy hears this tip and he decides to grab Mr. Three by the lit wick on his head and uses it to light the old, the oil soaked rope surrounding the candelabra that Karu like ran around and placed there. And this sets the whole candelabra made of wax and flames. When it's in flames, it eventually melts the wax and frees uh, all the friends that are there. So now freed, Nami and Vivi take out Miss Valentine while Mr. Five is taken out by Usopp. He doesn't do it in like a cool way. He fires another exploding star at, at Mr. Five and Mr. Five eats it, but it wasn't an exploding star. Usopp just lied when he shot it out. It was actually a hot sauce star. Mr. Five is like dying of the hot sauce and this distracts Mr. Five long enough for Zoro to make it out of the wax and cut him down. Once again, the allegations are not looking good for Zoro. Get that man a lawyer expeditiously. Zoro's freed and he cuts Mr. Five to pieces. At this point, Mr. Three just runs into the jungle in an attempt to escape, but he's tracked down by Luffy. Although when Luffy finds him, it's not just one Mr. Three, it's a bunch of Mr. Threes. Basically, he just created wax clones of himself and spread it throughout the forest. And he's like, you can't hit me. You don't know which one's me. He like taunts Luffy and Luffy ends up one shotting him on the first hit. Like he, he chooses right the first time. And Mr. Three's like surprised by this. He's like, how'd you know it was me? And Luffy just replies, instinct which was a cool scene. Also, Mr. Three had just insulted him for not being able to think that like, oh, you've run into your worst enemy. I'm super smart and intelligent and you're a beast that relies on instinct. And he just immediately kicks him in the face and says instinct. I, I think this is a little bit of foreshadowing, but you know, who, who knows? Who knows? All right, all right. We'll put that one <laughs> in the, in the go-to category. Okay, okay, okay. In the aftermath of this battle, Froggy is, is crying. Like he's crying waterfalls at the death of his friend. When Dory just gets up, apparently he wasn't dead. He was just knocked out. It turns out after a hundred years of scrapping every day, multiple times a day, just beefing every single day, their blades got so dull that Bragi didn't land a killing blow on Dory. He just knocked him out. Bragi is like relieved at this. He's, he's happy, he's like hugging Dory and Dory mockingly says to him, oh, are you that happy over just knocking me out? You know, you didn't even kill me. And Bragi playfully punches him in the arm like, oh, you know, that's not what I meant. And unfortunately, Bragi punched him right in his wound. And this fires up Dory. And now the beef is reignited, <laughs> right? They start to scrapping again. And thus a hundred year old beef is rekindled this legendary beef will go on for hopefully centuries more <laughs> now I, I know you're wondering after all of this action where the fuck is sanji bro he's been missing since the ship yeah so we have literally not seen sanji up to this point um he is beginning to grow worried about vivi and nami because of course he is he's a ladies man he's a little a little simp um, and he's like wandering through the forest, just like knocking out random animals with no problem. And he comes across that wax house that Mr. Three had built. And when he enters it, he receives a call from Mr. Zero himself, the seven warlords of the sea, Sir Crocodile, who mistakes him for Mr. Three. So Sanji has a conversation with Crocodile. Very obviously, he has no clue what the fuck is happening, like what is going on. But he lies to Crocodile and says, that, like, oh yeah, I've killed Vivi and the Straw Hats. You can just call off your hunt for the Straw Hats now. Like, it's not, like they're not around anymore. So Crocodile congratulates him and tells him that the unluckies, um, Miss Friday the Otter, Mr. Thirteen the Vulture, are coming to deliver an eternal log post to Alabasta so that he can return to Alabasta. Right on cue, the unluckies show up and attack Sanji because they obviously know that he is not Mr. Three, but he pretty easily defeats them and then he takes their log post. And then Crocodile, he returns to the phone and Crocodile tells him that this is their last communication and to wait further orders in Alabasta, which is why he gave him the pose. However, after he hangs up, Crocodile tells Miss All Sunday, the lady that we saw last time, to send Mr. Two 
to go finish off Mr. Three between uh, Little Garden and Alabasta. And this message is intercepted by Smoker, the Marine that we saw during Logtown, who is now chasing Luffy into the Grand Line. Even though the message he got was very scrambled, he knows that the Straw Hats have something to do with Vivi, who is the missing princess of Alabasta, and that they're somehow uh, connected to Baroque works. Sanji, he eventually wanders deep into the forest, and he finds them at Dory's campsite, where everyone's having a little party. They're all celebrating for their win. Again, even if it's just like a tiny little feast where they're eating dinosaur, it's still a party when the Straw Hats beat some people. They gotta do it. It's tradition. And they basically are talking about how like they're gonna be stuck here for another year. And he's like, why would why would that happen? We have the log pose right here. And he tells them like kind of what happens. Also, there's a very funny scene where Vivi hugs him excitedly because she gets to go back to her country. And he's like, ooh, finally someone's paid attention to me. So the people's that kind of explains what happened to them between him and uh, Crocodile, and they say, well, that's good that he's not chasing us anymore, that, like, there's something less to worry about. But Nami says that they need to leave immediately. Basically, like, she's kind of worried, I guess, that they'll break the log pose again, and that she's not, she doesn't want to be here for another year or so. Also, when they're trying to board the ship, Sanji and Zoro are trying to resolve their bet from way earlier, if you remember from the beginning of the episode, where they were trying to see who could who could kill the most meat. Zoro has killed a rhino and Sanji has killed a lizard, but they're about the same size. They're pretty big, but they're like the same size. Eventually, like Luffy tells them to shut the fuck up and get on the ship. That's not a big deal. They can end in a draw. It's whatever. However, as they set sail through the east end of the island, Dory and Bragi are standing at the edge of the island, and they explain that. There's another reason that humans don't often make it out of Little Garden, aside from just being stuck here for a year, um, that there's also a giant sea monster called the Island Eater. However, lucky for the Straw Hats, Dory and Bragi declare them as friends and vow that no one will hurt them, because if they did, that would be a shame on the pride of Elbaf. And so the sea monster comes out of the water, and it's a giant goldfish. The lie that Usopp said. He said yeah. it to Kaya uh, that he would find a giant goldfish and he did. He did find a giant goldfish. Nami tries to convince Luffy to sail around this fish but Luffy trusts Dory and Bragi and so he says no go forward keep going they'll take care of it for us and as they're swallowed by the goldfish Dory and Bragi let out this huge combined attack that like just the sheer force of it punctures the middle of this giant goldfish just like completely shatters through it and they just come out the other end completely unharmed and they just sail off although it does break Dory and Bragi's weapons finally so this is also where we get a flashback to Dory and Bragi a century ago where they were fearsome pirates who kind of did whatever they wanted no one could stop them and they were best friends up until they both killed two giant animals on Little Garden and a little girl had asked them, oh, which one's bigger? And they started arguing over who had the bigger kill. And that's why they've been fighting for the last 100 years. And as the Straw Hats sail away, Dory and Bragi turn to each other and are like, all right, the volcano's erupting. We gotta go, we gotta keep doing it. And they return to the center of the island to start just beating the shit out of each other again. I fucking love it. The beef never ends. They respect the beef. Even with no weapons. It's all it's all raw fist now. As they go to uh, Alabasta, Usopp declares that he will now he'll go to Elbaf, just like he promised earlier. That's a new part of his dream. Um, and Zoro trains even harder. He's just like, they're all kind of partying and laughing, and he's just in the corner just training over and over again because he laments that he wasn't able to break the wax um, and that he cost him a lot of time. And he mentions that he needs to be strong enough to shatter steel, which is as strong as the wax was claimed to be. While Nami comes down with a strange illness. Meanwhile, on Alabasta, Mr. Two gets ready to go fight the Straw Hats. And that's where we will end this episode. Kind of ends on a pretty good cliffhanger. So this is a shorter episode, as you may have noticed. This is kind of a shorter arc in general. It's like basically half the length of what we usually cover here. I and mean, it moves pretty quickly. It's not disjointed. Yeah, it's it's good. My first time reading it, like we mentioned at the start of the episode, I never got around to it because when One Piece was on TV all the years ago when I was a little kid watching it from the 4Kids dub, they skipped over it. And when I came back to One Piece, I didn't really see a reason to like read through it because I was kind of like, well, I know it happens and it doesn't seem to be that important, which is like kind of true. It sets up Usopp's whole dream though. And it sets up giant. Yeah, that is true. That it definitely did make, I think some of the other giant stuff later on feel a little less impactful for me because I hadn't really 
set around with Dory and Bragi, even though it feels a little isolated, which is kind of thematically relevant because it is prehistoric island, right? Like the island itself is isolated from the world and the story kind of is also, except for the Straw Hats interfering in it, because like this is like the first arc, I think that we really get like a real sense of like connection and build up because like we just had the villains from the last arc come back in and now we're setting up even more villains of the same organization, right? Like this is the first big storyline in One Piece that's like really connected. Um, I think this is such an integral part of it. And it also sets up stuff with Elbaf, which to this day is like kind of unresolved. We still have not been to Elbaf. There's some hints that when you're watching this that uh, Elbaf will be the, mo the next place we visit potentially in like the actual series, but uh, you know, it might not. But like that's, that's crazy, like 25 years later, we still haven't gone there. And I think it's really cool for the theory of Usopp where all his lies will come true. You literally got to see your first example of that in this arc where he, he talked about the goldfish to Kaya and he ended up seeing the goldfish a couple arcs later. Pay attention to Usopp's lies coming forward. That's a very popular fan theory. Yeah, we'll try to mention them as, as they come up, because um, he, he does it a lot. But yeah, this was, I'm gonna be honest, not my favorite arc we've read so far. Funny enough, I think my favorite arc is Sir Village, which is a new sub arc, so. That's crazy, because I actually really like this arc, because it felt like an adventure. It felt, it was the one of the most adventurous arcs. Like, they literally start when they get off the boat, like, oh, let's have an adventure, and they just go off and do it. and. I like those arts. I think, so I, I, I just praise it for being connected to Baroque works, but I honestly kind of might have liked it more if there was no Baroque works here. Like if yeah, it was same. just a venture with Bragi and Dory, I think that would have been really fun. Yeah, I think it, it also, it really builds on that world building in One Piece, right? Like it, it gives us, you know, these, these creatures who are older than like the world that we even kind of know of, right? Like at our farthest back, we, vaguely know about Roger at this point, not really a whole lot, and they are clearly way older than him, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I like that there are like so many things going on in the world of One Piece, and like <laughs> some of them aren't even, even connected to each other whatsoever, because like that's just how big and lived in this world is, and I think Little Garden is one of the first times that we really get to see that like there's a world outside of what our main characters see. It's not just about what we interact with. So yeah, I think it was, I think it was good. All right. Question of the day. Yes. This comes from our friend Ricardo, who you may have remembered from the first intro. Um, thank you for the, doing the intro with us, Ricardo. He asked us, I assume he's referring to the live action here, but we'll kind of give this question out. Why is the map to the Grand Line so important? Why couldn't pirates just get to the Baratier and then ask for directions into... So again, I think he's referring to the live action, which if you've seen the live action, this is a huge plot point that like all of the villains are kind of chasing after, except for Kuro, all of the villains are chasing after Luffy um, because he has a map that he stole from Captain Morgan um, that is takes him to the Grand Line and that Buggy and Arlong both want it. First off, to get to the Grand Line is like a treacherous journey from basically any part of the sea like you you're gonna have to make stops at islands to get there right so even if they like even if uh people at the baratier were able to like just point you in a direction you could just be sailing forever and never reach an island to like rest or stock up or anything right so you need a map that shows you the islands that you can go on your route to kind of navigate your way there right? right and places to avoid and all of that there's also like the reality that like the Baratier is a floating ship like it's not stationary uh it's kind of the point that Zeph makes is that like he doesn't want it to be stationary because he wants to be able to find people who are hungry so it's not like there are consistent directions that they can give you it's kind of like based on what's around but also the other thing is that if you're taking directions from somebody you are probably interacting with one of three groups of people, right? You have civilians who probably don't like pirates. You have uh, pirates who are also interested in the thing that you're interested in and have a vested interest in sabotaging you because 
they either want to stop you from doing your thing or just they want to like see you crash and burn and then steal your shit or three yeah. the marines who clearly don't want to help you um and even if they can't stop you they're not going to give you directions right um yeah. like you like you mentioned that the to the grand line and into the grand line is so treacherous that like there are things on the map that nami has that lets her know that like things are weird like it tells her that like it's just like oh there's a river here but topographically it goes up like that is that should not happen right there's also i think something i totally forgot about so just now like aside from zeph and arlon but we don't really know this at the time none of the characters we meet pre grand line have been to the grand line so like yeah i think that's why he was asking because of Zeph, he's like, if they end up being so buddy buddy with Zeph at the end, like, mm. why couldn't you just ask them, hey, point me to the Grand Line? <laughs> right. Because they would probably die on the way with no actual map of or direction, yeah. right? They'd just be traveling in the sea, hoping they're going the right direction. And we've already seen the sea will like turn you around and like, you know, do all sorts of crazy things to you. So you may think you're going in the dark, right direction, but you end up not being right? right or you end up like in the column belt and then it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> then you're kind of fucked right um, yep. and that's why you need a nap map and a good navigator which is why they have nami like nami is <laughs> literally the events of one piece would not happen without nami i think yeah. she is like indispensably the single most important crew member um probably the entire series i can't think of a single you time where i'm like you I saw would... luffy you saw Luffy at the beginning. He just hopped in a, he hopped yeah. in a barrel. <laughs> like he's like, I'm, he's like, I'm, I'm gonna die now. Out. I'm dead. Yeah, I'm hot. Yep. Um, like, and that's like the first thing they do is like after he gets his little swordsman, he's like, I need a navigator. I need a navigator. Mm -hmm. Like more than a cook, even more than his musician, right? Like he wanted mm -hmm. his musician, but he's like, before the musician, we get gotta get a navigator. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think there's so many factors involved in getting to the Grand Line, um, that really mean that you you don't want to trust people's words for it um and that you really want to have something that like actually guides you there um and that's that's why it's also kind of why i don't really like that plot line in the live action i think it makes sense with for what they're doing but it does feel a little uh it feels less spectacular than i'm used to from one piece right like it's not it's, it's like oh they're not fighting these people just for justice like they're fighting them because they get attacked because they have this map and then they're they're beating the, like it, it isn't it, it feels a little yeah. too traditional fighting for me rather than just like the like all of the good moral some things MacGuffin. yeah I, I, I don't like that um but yeah. you know it is what it is so thanks for the question ricardo um if you have any more let us know and i'll try not to answer them in the group chat next time <laughs> i'll try to save them for here um so anyway, thank you guys for listening. Um, like I said, this is a shorter episode. Next week, we should be back to this, probably a similar link that we've been doing because this is next arc is kind of longer. Um, and so we will see you then. You can find us on social media um, at Some Peace Pod on uh, anywhere that you would find us at, um, and you can find me at Sunny Girl L Y K. And I am at Emperor Zone. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye. Check you later. <laughs>